still have to jump off a cliff just knowing that you will not crash. Let me tell you, everybody has their baggage and everybody has their demon. So you might as well deal with your own demon and everything will work out fine. <laughs> If you're not in control of your emotions, your emotions will be in control of you. Tamina Ines, it is a condition or a disease that has no cure and likely leads to death. And it can also be life limiting. And I think there are some like cancer and uh, dementia. Dementia does not actually kill you on the point, but you begin to lose touch with reality and all. Terminal illness is um, a disease or a condition that can be cured and um, actually leads to one's death. Terminal illness to a large extent is not avoidable. But then there are some things we could do to prevent it from happening. In some cases, terminal illness is avoidable based on our lifestyle choices, the way we eat, then the way we live. Then I think there are several other ways we can also avoid it. Medically, I think so. I think so. It can be avoidable because sometimes some of the examples of these um, Ill illnesses are um, cancers and the rest. So sometimes the kind of things you eat, the kind of thing, um, you know, the, 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 what goes into your system breeds these illnesses. So it can, to me, it is um, avoidable to some extent. For instance, some persons that smokes, you are exposing your lungs to cancer and that can cause stamina diseases. And then to another point, it is actually normal because you can just wake up in the morning and then you notice that, oh, you've been diagnosed of um, something that you don't even know how it comes. Now, the point of talking about spirituality, I personally don't link spirituality with sickness or disease, so I would say no. I won't say it's spiritual. I would say it's much more of uh, a result, a back effect of some of our lifestyle choices. Then sometimes it can just come but then if we do a lot of regular checkups, I think we should be able to detect some of these things early. So I wouldn't say it's as a result of a punishment or a spiritual way of getting back at us. Some of the things that leads to um, terminal illnesses are actually what I would term as consequences, you know, you know your early stage um, lifestyle, and um, the way you use your body, the, the kind of things that goes into your system. Some persons are actually addicted to smoking and, and uh, um, intakes of hard drugs. And these things, ha these things ha actually have um, um, the negative effects on one's system. So to me, I think uh, it's um, as a result of consequences. It is, to me, it is not um, a spiritual, um, um, curse, you know, or you don't have any spiritual implication. What happens is the way you use whatever goes into your system as an implied um, negative um, consequences. So it doesn't have anything to do with uh, spirituality or diabolism. It's it's purely medical. I have never been diagnosed of um, any terminal diseases, but I know someone that has been. Though we are not close, but I know. No, I've never been diagnosed with terminal illness and I've not met anyone close. So far, I've not been um, diagnosed of such, uh, but I know of um, someone who, uh, who does um, as such illnesses. Okay, I was in the office one day and my colleague got a call that her, one of her mates have been diagnosed with um, leukemia. And I was like, what? That's like cancer of the blood. And she was just helpless. And at the point, even if I didn't really know the lady, I was confused. I began to even Google the, the symptoms and the lifespan and all. This person in question has, uh, is, uh, uh, is 
partially um, stroked. He has um, a partial stroke. And uh, over, over time, he has this difficulty in doing things for himself. And uh, people actually around him shy away from him. And it's, it's been difficult for him. One thing I, I believe we can do for them is to be with them. Like you're always with them. You have encouraging words for them. You don't make them feel they are sick. They are going to die very soon. You make them feel alive. Even if their lifespan is very short, you make them feel, oh, I am still alive. You create memories with them. You make them do things that you usually do. Because some of us, we tend to say, okay, hey, yeah, you are going to die soon, or you are this, you are that. Or, okay, I know of a lady when I was serving, and she had this problem with her legs. Now, we did not really want her to do heavy stuff, because we feel, oh, your legs. But then she, she always get offended. She wants to feel among. If you guys are doing this thing, let me also do it. So from there, I learned that, okay, make these people feel, okay, let them do what they want to do. Let them have fun with you. Have fun with them. Pray with them. Anything you know they like, just do. And don't make them feel death is around the corner. When one discovers that they have terminal illnesses, I think they go into anger and pain. and Some people don't even believe at first. and then. They just get to look down on themselves. Some don't even believe and they just feel this is not supposed to be me and all. So in cases like that, I feel we should be patient with them. Then we should be understanding. We should put ourselves in their shoes and try to help them go through the process. Then make them see hope, give them a lot of hope and make them understand that, okay, the little time they have left, they can actually make the best of it. And even that can help them going. It can get them back. Well, when I'm diagnosed of um, any terminal disease, I'll probably faint, but then I know I would definitely cry, but then life goes on. Ah, uh, well, nobody wants to end this life so soon. <laughs> so, well, my first reaction would be, well, now that I'm aware of terminal illnesses and ways to get rid of it or probably go through it, I feel I'll accept the fact that I have it first. Then I begin to work towards how to live better, put myself in order, put my house in order, and hope for the day. Well, my first reaction is, I think what really kills people a lot is um, ignorance. It's what they don't know that actually, um, you know, that actually kills. But in as much as I, I know I have been diagnosed with such, uh, the, the only thing I can do, I know um, life goes on. I, I can still help myself with, by comforting myself, by telling myself that, well, I, this is not the end of life. Um, whatever fortune I will still get after, afterwards will still be mine. So I won't give up. Rather, rather I will just um, um, comfort myself and move on. <laughs>
I would use that word to guide me through this conversation that we are having today. So you have been diagnosed with a terminal illness. First of all, I am sorry. Now, when I use the word curative, there is no curative measure in a terminal illness. And I think that this is where people have the confusion because now you've been given this diagnosis and now you're seeking for curative measures. I will talk about that. But I would also talk about how you would have to accept what that diagnosis is. Why? Because there are other things that you do need to do. And I don't want you to miss out on those things that you need to do because you are seeking for curative measures. And I do understand that there is a religious factor. I also understand that there is a cultural factor. And I have been on both sides of the spectrum. I lost my mother a few years ago. And I am ordained as a pastor. I am also in the nursing field. So I have been on two sides. Okay, I have the Nigerian aspect as well, and I have the American side of me, which is quite extreme. The American side is accept, and the Nigerian side is let us fight until we can't fight anymore. You know, and so there are pros and cons to that, and that's what we are going to talk about. So now, first of all, you have been diagnosed with a terminal illness or maybe a family member. So let me talk about you now being diagnosed with a terminal illness. The moment you find out that you have cancer, maybe you have a lump in your breast, maybe it's AIDS that has really gone, because AIDS really at this time is not supposed to kill you. MRSA at this time, and when I say time, I like I just mean um, in this century, in this era, at this time it is not supposed to kill because um, thank God there are all kinds of treatments out there. But let's just say that things have gone out of hand and the doctor has given you three months to six months to live. What do you do? The first thing you do is you inform people who mean something to you, your family. And we have not spoken for 20 years. We have not spoken for five years. That's the more reason why you need to call people. This is not the time to be thinking that everybody is your enemy. And if they know, they will only make it worse. No, that's not fair. There are certain people who need to know. I know too many people who have asked me to tell their family member, who has asked me to call their daughter and tell their daughter, you are going to die, let's say, like in the next two weeks. And your children don't even know that you've been diagnosed with this. Come on. No. I understand that this is a very, very hard pill to swallow. I get it. But you need to say something. This is the number one thing. And the reason why I'm hammering on this is because in Nigeria, we don't say anything. The first thing that we'll do is we'll drink anointing oil, we will go to church, we will cast out demons, and then we start to avoid people. Now, part of that avoidance does come with grieving. Because you do go through a grieving process when you know that you are going to die. You will go through a grieving process. And one of those processes or one of the symptoms... Or one of the things that will start to happen to you is you will tend to isolate yourself because you're trying to get used to the fact that you're going to leave these people that you love. And you know what? That's actually a good thing when you get to that point because that means that you're actually getting to a point of acceptance. I'm not talking about that now. I am talking about you being able to open your mouth and tell people. And I'm not using that word open your mouth as a form of insult. There are people who will just write a letter. Or there are people who will not say anything. No. You would need to cry it out. You would need to do all, all of your anger with God. Everything that you want to, to do. Any measure that you can take to get that anger out of you. Because this is a death sentence. Get it out of you. Cry. Scream. When I found out that my mother had cancer and she was already in the hospice stage... I literally chattered, <laughs> like I chattered a motorcycle, I chattered an Okada, I'm telling you, I left the cars, I left the drivers, I left everything, I sat on that Okada and I just told the man to just keep driving. That was my way of, 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 of being calm and having to come to grisp with this news. So you do whatever you will have to do to come to terms with this diagnosis. Now, can cancer be cured? Definitely, when it is found early. But when it starts to metastasize, meaning when it starts to spread into the body, uh, yeah, the next option may really, really be to transcend, which 
which is to die. So I'm going to take a break now. And when I come back, I would encourage you on the things that you can do to wrap up. Welcome back. This is Emotions with Omanasa. We have been talking about how to handle the news of a terminal illness. You've been diagnosed with cancer. You've been diagnosed with cardiovascular issues. You've been diagnosed with AIDS. And like when I say AIDS, like I'm talking about like it's gone out of hand. Okay. Um, there are just like all kinds of problems. Like you probably had an accident and it just didn't heal. Like the wounds just didn't heal like a broken leg or like a broken foot. Um, in like infection. You know, or when the blood now is infected with, with, with um, all kinds of pus. I actually had a patient once who, the only problem she had was she had what we call pitting, edema. I have had edema before, but the moment I found out that I was pitting, and that was in my um, 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 legs, in my ankles, if you touch your ankles and you see that it is pitting, that is not a good sign. That is a sign of heart problems. Uh, blood is not circulating the way that it's supposed to circulate. Now, if you let that go on for so long, you know, you are praying now and you're casting out demons. You're not seeing a doctor. What is going to happen is the blood really would definitely really just stop flowing in that area. And then what will happen is that whole area will become black. And then it would start to chip. And then it will literally be like you're breaking a bone or like you're breaking a biscuit and there are people who do die from that so there are all kinds of things all kinds of illnesses that could get a diagnosis of hospice hospice means when you have three to six months to live now when you have been diagnosed with a terminal disease meaning you will die of course you do have to seek curative measures but what else you have to tell your family you tell your daughter, you tell your husband, you tell your wife, you tell your family members. And eh, they are enemies. Maybe it was even them who even eh, 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 saw to it that I would have this illness. Please stop that. Just, 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 just stop that. I do know that there is a factor of how people go to Babalao and Badbele and all of that. No. But that's not where I'm going now. I am talking about the... This, as in this is a matter of life and death you are going to die at this point so what you want to do the first thing is yes you do seek your curative measures so that that could give you like some kind of peace of mind but let me tell you this as a nursing assistant let me tell you this sometimes when you try to fix something that is not going to fix i have seen it happen especially with cancer they start to put feeding tubes in you and when they put feeding tubes in you or an IV, you start to swell that only accelerates your death. So let's say that if you were going to die in three months, you could probably die in two months. Why? Because your body is swelling. Your body is taking all of this chemical and really for no reason because it's not acting on something. You understand? Medicine only works when it's acting on something, when there is an attack and it's fighting an attack. But when cancer has gotten to, to stage four, when it has already like metastasize the only thing that you can do at that point is pain relievers and i'm not going to mention their names because i don't want you to go out and take a certain type of pain reliever and it would kill you faster because everybody's tolerance level is different please when you are seeking for pain relievers number one i don't get it off the counter okay number two try so hard especially with cancer because cancer is very very painful um like for my mom we were all shocked at how she took a specific drug that was actually for headache but with an overdose of that drug she was actually fine so we didn't give her narcotics even before you get to those narcotics please let me give you advice at this time you've already planned your funeral let me tell you why it's important for you yourself to plan your funeral. There are certain people that you don't want at your funeral. Can you imagine like maybe Mama Bosse, you did not speak to her like for 30 years and you do not intend to speak to her for like, like you have no intentions of fixing that. And then Mama Bosse now comes to your funeral and she's looking over your body. Haba, no now. <laughs> so there are some things 
that you do have to take off, take care of. Please do not say, eh, now, I will not be here. So what difference does it make? It makes a lot of difference. If your family has all kinds of sibling rivalry, all kinds of drama in your family, it is very selfish of you to leave your family in that same state. Make sure that everybody has reconciled. Make sure that everybody knows what you want to wear or at your funeral. Do you want to wear black? Do you want white? I've seen funerals where people are putting on the wedding, <laughs> where the person is worn their wedding gown. You don't know if they even liked the man that they were even with. So these things are very, very important. Do you want your nails painted or not? Are you from a certain type of religion where you don't want makeup on your face? Do you want the the cotton in your nose or not you understand this is a conversation that you should have have you written a will how much are you leaving behind for everyone to pay for your funeral or you expect people to take care of your funeral which is selfish by the way and now like you may tell me oh yeah but it's a cultural thing eh? in nigeria like is the family no that is not true because I know people in Nigeria who have planned their funeral and they are in their 50s. I know people who have bought a plot of land already. So do you want to be buried in Kafanchan or in Kaduna? Do you want to be buried in your home or at the back of your home? Ah, they should know that. No, they don't know. Let me tell you something. Like when you die, people will start fighting if you did not plan. This is your responsibility. And I know, okay, yes, now it seems harsh. So now you have to deal with the fact that you are going to die. But hey, you are going to go to a better place. So how about we make everybody's life here a little bit easier? So that's the first thing that you do is you start planning. My mother looked at me. My mother was a reverend. My mother used anointing oil for so many years. And that's why she actually, that is why her cancer met metastasized because she did not seek for curative measures at the beginning she started seeking for curative measures and radiation and all of that when it was already at stage four which of course it had already metastasized so there's no miracle that can happen at that time when you hear this is the diagnosis okay make sure that you tackle it immediately because your life could be saved if you're at the point where your life cannot be saved at all please start planning start cleaning up okay your children don't know who their father is or who their mother is please introduce them tell them this is the time to write a will this is the time to plan the funeral this is the time to call all your enemies this is the time to pay your debts okay there are some people that when they hear that you have died they are not crying because they miss you they are crying because you owed them like three million or five million where are they going to get it from eh you know this is the time to clean up you don't want a situation where now you are dead and people are now trying to, 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 to figure out what to do. They don't know where to bury you. They don't know your passwords, passwords to the computer, passwords to your bank account, passwords to your phone. This is when to delete some messages because some things really should go with you to heaven. People do not need to know. So this is the time to clean up. But you know what? Most of all, as I round up, most of all, the major thing that you should do is to have a POA. What is a POA? A POA is a power of attorney. Who is your power of attorney? Your power of attorney is your daughter, is your son, is somebody who you really trust so that God forbid, let's say that you became unconscious, like you're still alive, oh, but you're incapacitated, like you really cannot talk because the pain is so much. Who is going to talk on your behalf? Don't automatically think, hey now, like it to be your husband. You are your husband that have been fighting for how many years? Or it will be your sister, your sister who does not like you and everybody knows that? No. So as soon as you hear that there is a terminal illness going on, you would need to look for a POA. That is a power of attorney. Somebody who would fight for you. Somebody who would tell the doctor, oh, this is what she would have wanted. And let me tell you something about a POA. As soon as you die, the POA is, is relinquished. And guess what? It's now the next of kin. Okay, and your next of kin is not necessarily who is written down. You do need to let people know who you would want. Oh, this is who I want to handle my matters if anything should happen to me. And sometimes it is not necessarily blood. Okay, so these are the things that you need to do when you hear that there is a terminal illness. Once again, I am so sorry that you have been diagnosed with this. If I'm talking to you, I'm so sorry that you have been diagnosed with this. Please. Um, do know that you are going to a better place. Make your life right. 
with God in whatever religion in which you serve, pay off your debts, clean up, okay, clean up. And you know what? Most of all, still have fun. Do that one thing that you really, really wanted to do, like maybe like travel to Dubai or maybe feed the hungry. Do that one thing that you really, really wanted to do, okay? Until next time, God bless you. Bye-bye. You will have to jump off a cliff just knowing that you will not crash. tell you everybody has their baggage and everybody has their demon so you might as well deal with your own demon and everything will work out fine <laughs> if you're not in control of your emotions your emotions will be in control of you